Well, it is the greatest honor to welcome back, I want to say welcome home, Barbara Brown Taylor. And that's really the only introduction I want to make. Welcome to Barbara Brown Taylor. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to uh, read a poem that is for many a prayer. Be patient toward that that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given to you because you have not been able to live them. And the point is, live everything, live the questions. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Amen. I need that. Could I have that, please? Yes. Could well, I've got my, my notes on okay. it first. Okay, afterwards. But I, I, no, you can give it to me okay, afterwards. Okay, I'll give it to okay. you afterwards. Live the questions. Uh -huh. And it sounds like an invitation to take a quest. Mm. And, and I think, I mean, many of us would, would prefer to have it all sort of worked out and tied up in a knot. And this, we just have been turned upside down by all of this. And I would love it if we could speak today a little bit about taking the quest. What's a quest? According to Webster's Dictionary, I taught college. I'm used to this being the first line of any essay answer. But it's a long and arduous journey in search of something. In medieval romance, it's a knight's expedition to accomplish a very particular task. Um, as I think about the long and arduous journey in search of something, what may be more relevant, well, those are all relevant, but I think a lot about identity and meaning and purpose, especially in the wake of the last almost two years, and how that's changed our ideas about everything, family, church, um, purpose, identity. Uh, so, because you introduced me so well, I just wanted to thank you again for inviting me back home. I feel really safe with you and safe in this place. And um, I know a lot of you and um, I'm happy to be back here, so thank you. And, and the topic of quest, I, I know the theme for the year has been hope, but Chip tweaked it for me to talk about quest. And full disclosure, we had a telephone conversation last week and I've been filling up a yellow pad since then, thinking about quest and the twists and turns in the path of quest. and what we're questing for, and so I don't want to preempt the conversation, but I want them to know we've previewed the conversation. We have previewed That's the conversation. It. And it really is a quest for hope, isn't it? Um, and, I, and I wonder when in your life you first became aware that you were on a quest. I um, could, we, we got a week, about a week? Could we do about, okay. Yes. Like each decade, but, well, I, but where, I mean, where the mind goes quickly, especially with the, the kind of golden fleece quest, is how enamored I was of the medieval romantic quest. You know, that early on I was the first child, a daughter uh, of a, a set of parents who thought I could do and would do anything. And so they set me on a quest. Nothing you can't do. Nothing you can't be which is a little daunting, I'll tell you. You know, you accept it when you're young, but the first quest was to be extraordinary. Hmm. To be extraordinary, was that something that you felt was put on you? Oh, put on me, it was assigned, and yeah. I accepted the assignment, because there was so much, what, glory and honor that went with the possibility. Soon we'll get there's to the, about to, that, to the crashing of that, yeah, yeah. 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 All glory and law to honor yeah. to Barbara. Yeah, yeah, there's a yeah. hymn, but it doesn't have my name in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> So yeah. I think that was just early childhood things, you know, first child, only yeah. child for three years, and then sisters showed up. We have a recording of me at age three looking at my little sister and saying, doesn't she need a shot? 
<laughs> Can't we take her to the doctor and put a needle in her somewhere? So yeah. I was not happy to be joined for a while. I've often quoted C.J. Young who said the big, biggest psychic burden on a child is the unlived life of their parents. That, yes. And, and so we go to the second quest, the unlived life, especially of a very, um, what, important in my life, dominant father who had left the Roman Catholic Church as a boy, furious with it, and kept his children away from religion. And after I became attracted to religion under my own gasoline and decided to go to divinity school, my mother turned around at the sink one day and said, we did not raise you to be religious and you will get over this. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's sort of when I figured out that um, there was some, maybe, I don't know, what does a secular child do to rebel, but, you know, explore faith. So, and, and then, interestingly, years later, both my parents were confirmed in the Episcopal Church, so they became people I saw regularly on a on a basis, and my two sisters were baptized because I was the only one. Um, but then my father said, my mother always wanted me to be a priest, and you made her wish come true a generation later. Oh, wow. And I thought, you thief, you devil. <laughs> that was my rebellion. Yes. And you just put it right into the plan. But, but there you go. That was a quest. I, I'm struck that um, we sort of move through life, uh, you know, trying to sort of find our way, and maybe we feel that all things are well, and then something comes to dislodge that in our lives, which takes us to a deeper quest. Say something about moving, what, over a dozen times as a child? What, how did that affect you and sort of reorient you to certain questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, people think I was in the military. They say, where are you from? And I say, I wish I knew. I mean, I was born in Indiana, but left in six months because dad was getting a PhD at Purdue. And we weren't military, but he was a psychologist who started out with a VA, so that I grew up in the garden spots of Leavenworth, Kansas, and Dublin, Ohio, where there were VA hospitals. And then he entered academic psychology. You can see why he was an important figure. Our, our you know, like 1950s, 60s lives, our life followed his vocational life. So there were 13 addresses by the time I was in ninth grade. And I didn't go to any school, you know, for more than two or three years. but. Um, I fell in love with books. I became a comedian because I was always the new kid in class and humor was the best way to make friends. And I always felt a bit of an alien because the new kid who has gone pretty fast also. But it made for a real tight family bond, a real tight nuclear family because that was the moving unit, you know, that showed up at every address. So, so that was... Um, a unit, but it, it did throw me into my head and my inner resources in ways that perhaps my youngest sister, who had a lot of stability, uh, had her mm -hmm. stability was outside her a lot in a known community, a known neighborhood, known paths to school, etc. So, you know, even within a six-year age difference, really different kids. Mm -hmm. So it was really in the sort of dislodgement that you you found a sense of stability, as you say, in family. In, in books, and I'm sort of struck that um, that's a wonderful thing for us to think about in, in our lives as we think about being dislodged, uh, wondering who, where are we, what's becoming of us, what is the source, uh, what are the sources that bring stability to our lives. Um, tell us about the, uh, the, the quest for vocation you've spoken about, about becoming a priest, but Say something about how that sort of emerged in your heart and kind of, um, you know, became, you know, well, became this precarious quest. It's really is a precarious quest to become a priest. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they, we didn't get a full disclaimer of what it would mean. Yeah, but even at the beginning, when, yeah. people, when you say, I feel called to something, yeah. and they say, well, I'm not really sure you do. I know, isn't that yeah. something? In fact, some of us don't think you are at all. I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that happened. Yeah, and we've all had rejection, haven't we? We've all felt like we were called to do something important, and someone talked us out of it, right? So say something about that quest for vocation and, and how you listen to the voice within as opposed to maybe some of the voices without, particularly in a time when women 
we're not look favorably upon in the priesthood. It's true. I went to seminary before it was before I was an Episcopalian. I went to seminary. Oh, don't tell anybody except this. That's why I hate this being taped. Is is people? I went to seminary thinking the seminary ordained you, and then you chose your church. You know, you chose your yeah. Don't tell anybody. So the the good news is, and we went to the same seminary, is that I had terrific freedom to explore things. But it wasn't until my sophomore year, middle year, that I found the Episcopal Church. So things started to sharpen then, and I was in my mid-20s, but it wasn't even legal for women to be ordained in the Episcopal Church. Actually, that's the first time I went to the rector of Christ Church New Haven mm. and said, I want to be confirmed. And he said, we'll talk about it. Let's meet for about a year. I said, no, I want to join your church now. Yeah. And he said, well, here's, here's your first Charles Williams novel. <laughs> You know, and we'll, we'll meet for a year. So he was the first to stall me. When he heard my um, religious history, he said, Barbara, you're an ecclesiastical harlot. <laughs> so he wanted to know that this one would last. Um, so it, it was a long time coming. It was actually after I was a graduate of a seminary that I started working in an Episcopal church part-time. But at that time, it was all attraction chip. It wasn't an inner resource idea. It was people I wanted to be like and be with. And they were clergy and they were laity, but they, they gathered around an altar and they sang together and they did incredible things in the city of Atlanta. So it was, it was a belonging thing. Yes. What group do I want to be part of? And it was that group. So I did the same thing. Did you? I went to Yale Divinity School. Uh, and actually, I thought I was going to get a PhD in religious and philosophical ethics. And then sort of showed up and discovered this... Um, this amazing community. And, um, and I think the big shift for me was that I thought that the religious life was really the study of God. <laughs> you know, that what one pursues is a kind of you know, orthodoxy. If I can just figure out God in, in all the various theologies, it will just sort of come alive uh, like a constellation and I will reach total fulfillment. Uh, and it wasn't until going into the, you may recall, the Henry Nouwen Chapel. Uh, very early in the morning, I've told the story here before, where um, I went from uh, trying to study these books, like you saw in my office, to seeing uh, about uh, 25 uh, Korean Presbyterians sitting in silence, uh, or listening to scripture um, and uh, in front of a candle. And the shift went from religion as something to study and to figure out to what we might think of as orthoproxy, the practice and the opening of God to enter into one's life. Yeah. That's a huge journey from orthodoxy and to orthopraxy. Yeah. You know, right thinking and then right practice that we never get right, right? Yeah. But we never do. That we engage because that becomes bodily. That was really why I wrote Altar in the World was to think about orthopraxy and ways in which you get bodily involved mm -hmm. in this wish to, this quest this wish to know more, be more, be nearer, walk deeper. So how do you do with opening yourself up to vulnerability um, back in seminary? I mean, that was, a, that was a big moment to say. And then all of a sudden to get through that process and discover you had this super power, power for preaching. I mean, what a, what a shift. Come on, come on, Barbara. What a shift. Yeah. When did, when did you realize that a big part of your vocation was going to be the preaching life? Just a few weeks ago, I got to go back to St. Luke's Church, Atlanta, for the installation of the new rector, Winnie Varghese, who just showed up from Trinity Church in New York. And that's the first place I was ever hired as a part-time seminarian, Miss Barbara Brown, um, graduate of Yale Divinity School, working as a secretary at Candler School of Theology for $8,000 a year, so I stole toilet paper out of the bathroom because I couldn't afford it. I paid it back later. but. But it was wonderful to go back there. That's the first place I was ever invited to address a congregation. And it was a poorly attended Holy Week service. And, and I was assigned to stand between pews down on the floor, because there were 10 people there. Um, but that's the first time I was invited to do that. And someone came up afterwards and said, could I have a copy of that? And I thought, then I thought, I think I just sold my first short story. But, but later I thought it's because it was so opaque, she needed to read it because she couldn't make any sense of what I was saying. But, you know, we, we go between those extremes. So I, I got to go back there again. So that is the place I identify as the first time that I was not only allowed to speak, but got a response from one person. 
And I went through times in my life when I needed it to be hundreds of people, and I'm back to needing it to be one person again. Hmm. First time I preached, I was at the back of the church, and a woman came uh, afterwards. I was waiting for someone to say, good sermon. No one said anything. The last woman said, you know what's so wonderful about the Episcopal Church? I said, what's that? And she said, if the sermon's bad, there's always a Eucharist. <laughs> <laughs> and she was right, so, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, That's why we go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so again, as we sort of think about the journey that you've been on, um, what was it like to discover that you had this gift, and did it overwhelm you? Yeah. Yeah. Did Did you, you know, have have you felt like, you know, persistent performance anxiety? At persistent performance anxiety. Next question. You know, they, Baylor University launched some most effective preachers thing, and I didn't enter that contest, but I was the only woman on the list, and that immediately put me into performance anxiety. You now have to be better not only than other people, but you have to be better than you were last time. And I still remember it when that happened. I was at Little Grace Calvary Church in Clarksville, Georgia, which seated 80 people. And I remember some guy who came in in Bermuda shorts after that list came out. He was just like bird watching. He was trying to find everybody on the list and get his photo with them and move on to the next place. But he, <laughs> I can't remember how it happened, but at any rate, at one point I heard him audibly say, well, what was so great about that? <laughs> And I'll never forget it, you know, so, and so, yeah, you begin, I guess healthy people don't let that in, you know, healthy people don't let that in. And my bishop, in response to something like that, said, um, Barbara, don't worry, the people you think love you, they don't love you as much as you think they love you, and the people who hate you, they don't hate you as much as you think they hate you, so that was relaxing. <laughs> Sounds fabulous. Yeah. And so... You know, you, you emerge from this childhood into this vocation, into, the, into this extraordinary uh, gift, and you find yourself at, at that church. Um, and, and perhaps at that moment, uh, what a beautiful setting. It's a community that you still live in. Um, and people are coming in from all over. And then, as it is with quests, there are unintended circumstances. Um, and say something about that. People start to show up and and the, and the community shifts a little bit. All of a sudden, there are a lot of outsiders. You know, my persistent sadness about that is, is the community of that church forgot that they were the draw, because they were the draw. That's why I was there, and that's why people in the community were coming there, unchurched people and people from other traditions um, were coming there, but when I got some notoriety, the congregation forgot they were the draw, and there wasn't room you know, for the, for the heart of the community, the people who supported the project to sit anymore, because there were other people. I, you know, th again, please think of a place that is not even this big. So this is not a huge thing I'm talking about, but it did require going to a lot of services per day and bringing up conversations about how we might grow like everybody else in town had. But we had a beautiful, beautiful historic sanctuary in you know, the 1840s. And, uh, and there were good arguments posed at the time. We want to stay involved in social justice and we don't want to be funding a new building mortgage. So it just became um, imperative for me to go. Mm -hmm. So then there's this, um, this shift of moving outside of the church, which is a really a scary thing, um, into a whole new vocation. I mean, you'd, you had you already had been in this strange vocation, and then all of a sudden you moved to a different vocation, um, leaving church. Mm -hmm. Tell us about leaving church. Um, leaving church was an unfortunate title <laughs> because I still have friends who say they haven't read it yet because they're afraid of what it says. But that was um, the first book I wrote um, that was uh, in first person because part of what I did was lose my voice. I had a we voice, we believe, we're called to. We have gathered here today to do this. I had we language, and I had a book of common prayer, and I had a vocabulary, I had a parking spot, I had an outfit, and I knew what my job was. Um, Piedmont College decided to have a religion philosophy major and invited me to be the religion part of that. So all of a sudden, um, I was in front of a classroom where we didn't work, 
It, there was not a lot of um, world religious diversity, but there was huge Christian diversity. Mercy, my little Episcopal language, turned out to be the bonsai language, you know, the little 2% language, because I had Seventh-day Adventists, I had Pentecostals, I had every kind of Baptist in the world, very few mainline, lots of community churches that didn't identify um, denominationally, a lot of mega churches. Um, students came in with religious experiences I was unfamiliar with. and. And when I told them they were Protestants, they'd never heard that before. And the Catholics had not you know, realized that, I, it was just a remarkable uh, shift. So uh, Leaving Church was the first book in I. That was all I mm -hmm. thought I could say with any authenticity anymore was I, 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 I. One guy read that book, he said, yeah, but he said, but I didn't buy it. I mean, I flipped through it, it's just I, 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 I. I said, it's a memoir? I mean, <laughs> memoirs are, have got a lot of first person. but. Um, that was really about leaving parish ministry full time. It was not about leaving church. Mm -hmm. And it was about moving into the classroom where a lot of my Presbyterian friends said, you know, we think that's ministry. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, that's so relieving. Because in my tradition, it's really congregationally focused. So, so I picked up a new vocation of teaching and, um, and learned to love students in the same way I had loved congregations, except the students only stayed a semester or four years at most. And it was a much better life for an introvert. They wanted me to go to the library. My president did. He wanted me to go to conferences. He wanted me to you know, do things that had not been on my list in churches. So mm -hmm. ended up being the longest job I've ever had, 19 and a half years of teaching. You wrote about this movement in the quest and the journey of uh, an altar in the world. Tell us what it means to have an altar in the world. Oh, in every book, I think you mentioned it, I, I sort of take on a problem that's not my problem alone, but things that I've heard from people I care about. And, and one of them is, you know, does God operate beyond the church? Because, you know, I hear so much. There's a, there was a sign in my community, one of our famous church signs, um, along with give Satan an inch and he will be your ruler. But um, it, was, it said, come inside, God's been waiting for you here. And, and a lot of people had that idea that, that God was waiting for them inside churches, but they wanted to know why then they had such a sense of the divine outside of churches <laughs> in a lot of different places, hospices and national forests and at babies' cribs. And so it seemed like the thing to do to explore what it meant in the story of Jacob, biblically, for him to be running away from home and be in the middle of, in my imagination, nowhere, and to choose a rock for his pillow and to, to have a vision of a ladder with its top in heaven and its feet on earth and angels going up and down between the two and in the morning to set up an altar there and pour oil on it and say, behold, God was in this place and I, I did not know. And it occurred to me that those places are everywhere, that you can't walk through this world you know, without whacking your shins on an altar. But, but how have we been woken up to those? And it, you know, short stories, the Episcopal tradition ended up being helpful to me because I'd learned about sacraments, earthly embodied things that are conduits to the invisible, ineffable things. So I didn't have a, too much of a problem talking about an altar in the world. One of my favorite things to do here is when people come and say, can I have a tour of the church? I take them outside and I say, I'm so sorry, you know, I can't because they're not here right now. You know, um, oh, you know, they're, oh, oh, you know, they're, they're elsewhere. And, and, and yet this is a, this is a, a kind of a, uh, a center, uh, where we try to, to love and to empower people to see yes. the altars that they have in the world. And I'm, I'm struck that, that, that altars are, are both places where we, um, where we make sacrifices in our lives. We sacrifice for our families. We sacrifice in the context of work, communities, the world. Um, but there are also uh, places that hopefully we meet God, we meet, we meet the Spirit. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wonder, um, I wanna move on to holy envy in just a moment, but mm -hmm. I wanna ask you uh, throughout the quest how your how your spirituality and how your practices have changed um, as you've taken these moments, you know, these big, big experiences. I mean, 
from childhood and all the change to the vocation of priesthood to moving into, um, you know, moving out of you know, parish ministry into, into university and then being a guest in all these different places. I mean, you have to have, by the way, this is her new book, Always a Guest. But to be a guest means that you're, you're taking something with you everywhere you go um, and carrying with you hopefully a kind of spirituality that will sustain you. Uh, it's not easy to get on planes and go to these different places. So I'm wondering if you could tell me um, you know, maybe what your spirituality was like when you first got started and how, as, we, as you've moved into the altar in the world, how you have found, how and where you've found the spirit in your quest. You know, I, it, I, I know how it feels more than I can put it into words. It has felt like this, it, you know, that altar in the world felt like this. And by the way, our mutual, I think, friend, John Philip Newell, says even places this grand and this well attended are side chapels to, the, to the, the great cathedral of creation. And it is in your language where we come to remember we belong to the universe. You know, so in the classroom, it went like this, got bigger. And, and what has happened to my spirituality is a disappointment to some people because it has become, um, I, words fail me. It has become present in all. It has become unitive. It has become cosmic, which means that I've lost a lot of my specialized religious language. And part of that was being a guest all the time because you don't go to a known community. You go to an unknown place and you bring your own altar with you. Um, although I've been received so beautifully at so many places, that I didn't need to. The altar was there already. But it meant I couldn't think about, you know, what I knew was going on with you last week or, or what I knew your group was dealing with in the church. I had to go with, like, common human experience, believing we all wake up in the middle of the night and can hear our hearts beat louder than we ever have before, and we all lose someone we love, and, and, we, and we all wonder what happens when the jobs that have satisfied us run out or when the marriage we counted on. You know, these are mostly hurtful scary things that show up on the quest, which was not what we thought the quest would be about. Um, but I went instead with a confidence that I knew what it was to be human, and that I could start with that and a text that they knew and I knew, and we would somehow find a, a, a triangle in, into all those things. So mm -hmm. I, I loved that part, and I also loved, um, I loved it for them and for me that I would leave when I was done. It was a whole different gig than being the person who would be back next week, because that's a whole different way of sustaining hope. Um, but the lovely freedom for me about being a guest speaker is, is people, I think, could hear me in, in undefended ways that they could not have if I had been their person, and I was gonna be back next week. So whether they woke up or just wished I would go away, it, it was gonna be over soon, you know? Yeah. They were going to wake up and go back to, to family. So for them and for me, there was freedom, I think, to listen and speak in ways that are not when you're engaged or married, you know, to, to your person. Well, I love this idea of being opened up. And, and I think um, we tend to sort of shrink wrap religion into a brand. Um, and, and yet this continual opening uh, doesn't necessarily need to to be a threat mm -hmm. to our faith in Christ, uh, but it's an opening to a larger world uh, and to loving um, everyone. And I think you wrote about this in Holy Envy. What made you envious? Oh, in all the great religions of the world? Yeah, what was, tell, us, tell everyone who hasn't read it what that book was about. Because well, we're gonna get all your books read here, so that's why I'm going through I, all this. Thank you, I really appreciate this trajectory, it's yeah. nice. <laughs> Um, Holy Envy uh, ended up being, I mean, the last memoirish book. I, I mean, they're not even memoirs, they're just first person narrative. Again, they're not claiming anything but a story that, that I was part of. And it, it started out wanting to be a, a book about 20 years of teaching world religions, you know, for the Christian pastor in the room to be the one who's entrusted with the treasures of the great religions of the world and who had to learn how to do that in the way I wished it would be done unto my tradition. If there were a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Jew teaching my faith, 
that, I mean, it was a Christian teaching, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So I wanted to teach the great traditions in a total of five days each, five class sessions, <laughs> including my own. Um, but I wanted to pay a tribute to the students and how, they, how much they taught me, both about the faith they had and about the fears they entered this um, class with. And early on, the offense they felt that a Christian was not going to tell them what was wrong with all the other religions, because they thought that was my job. Um, but Holy Envy ended up being really about this, this expansion of faith you talked about. There's a wonderful prayer in the prayers of the people here about being partners with those in all the world's religions, yes. that we can increase in respect and cooperation in in addressing the world's hurts. And, and that was what I was delivered to, was there were irreconcilable differences theologically and in terms of practice and in terms of culture um, in the religions I studied and taught, but that we all were addressing questions of why are we here and what are we supposed to be doing and what happens after we die and what can we do in the meantime. And so those were precious gifts, especially when we went to visit those communities. So, so Holy Envy was sort of the latest of these mm -hmm. big expansions of embrace, not because I fully understand, but because of the human beings I met along the way. I, I, I shared with you last night, and I'll, I'll just say again, what an experience it was for me to be um, a couple of years ago with uh, about 30 people from various world religions and no religion at all, and to see smile on pe people's faces and to feel as like I had discovered family, you know, mm -hmm. that there was something altogether complete. And, and what a shift that was for, for me at the beginning of my, of my journey where, you know, we didn't really mix well with the Presbyterians, you know, <laughs> much less, you know. Any, other Episcopalians. Other, yeah, exactly, you know, and so, you know, so I love this idea of um, a quest for the divine that continues to open us up. And, there, and I think there are crises along the way. Like, are you sure about this? Mm -hmm. Am I going to lose this? Am mm -hmm. I going to gain this? Um, but mm -hmm. to trust this emerging, this emerging quest. Um, I have a theory about your 30 people is mm -hmm. in, in this quest to, to befriend people of other traditions and allow them to befriend me, we were all at the edges of our traditions. You know, I kind of sometimes think of these religious traditions, I've talked about them as treasure chests, but they also look like an egg to me, you know, with a yolk, and you need people at the center. You really need people at the center who are holding down the orthodoxy and the orthopraxy. But, but it, a good religious tradition has got a lot of room, you know, to move out toward the edges. And I think when you meet people at the edge of your tradition and they're at the edge of theirs, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing. It's kind of a wilderness journey. And yeah. you don't ask a whole lot of questions when you're rounding up the tents at night, you know. And who's got a match? Do you have a leech on your leg? I've got a leech. Oh, does anybody know how to get this off? I do. Yeah. You know, there's just some, some stuff that happens around the campfire that's great. It is, and, and I, I want to move to hope now, but it, it gives me so much hope in the midst of all of our various divisions to think that uh, when we have a deep respect for the dignity of every human being and when we can join and connect with people across difference, uh, we're able to be weavers, you know, in, in, in healing the fabric of our torn world, our torn, torn democracy. So let's talk about hope. Mm -hmm. So we've been on this quest, we, and, I, and I just want to thank you for, I was thinking about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, and he describes um, a hero as a person who takes a journey but also comes back and tells people about it. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one of the things that I think we all love about your work is your willingness to be real and vulnerable, to write about the different experiences of your life, um, and then to come and, and to talk about it and to say, this is my story, not yours but here are some, some things that I've learned along the way. Yeah. Um, so, so what have you learned about hope along the way? What is hope? I'm gonna tell you. Um, Great. My vocation in life is to overshare and give too much information and then put it in print and then other people come up afterwards and said, oh, so glad you said that because I thought I was the only one. 
that's my vocation in life. So that's, that's why the books are awkward at some points and embarrassing is that's my job, is to go ahead and be awkward and embarrassing, to, hopefully to normalize the rest of you who haven't perhaps not yet admitted that you feel awkward and embarrassed, so there. That's how I'm extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have had a real, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, I told he, I said, I'm a writer, you just gotta live with the fact I'm gonna bring notes up here. But, but if I can talk about quests for a minute yep. to get to the question about sure. hope, and where are we on our time? We're doing great. Okay. Um, I, I identify as a spiritual contrarian more and more, which is when people are looking over there, I like to look there, because there's usually an ignored wonderful thing back there because everybody's looking there. Um, and so I'd like to talk about some of the twists and turns in the quest that have kept me engaged in the quest and that I also wish were not true. Um, and one is that you want the quest to benefit you. I mean, most of what we're questing for, I think, is achievement, enlightenment, salvation, redemption, exhilaration, experience, the golden fleece. Um, and sometimes you get home with a golden fleece and say, what am I supposed to do with this thing? Like, do you wear it? Do you put it on the mantelpiece? You know, but, but instead, I think that the quest reveals you. The quest reveals you. You want it to benefit you. You want the benefits of faith the benefits of the medieval romance. You want your superpowers and you're real interested in what your costume's gonna look like. And then it turns out that the quest reveals the hubris in your quest and the self-regard in the quest and even the spiritual gluttony in the quest for some of us, which Jesus didn't talk enough about, except when he blessed those who were poor in spirit. But I think he could have said something about the, the spiritual gluttons among us. And then often what it, the quest has revealed in me is the shakes, the sweats, the fear of failure. You know, that I set out on the noble quest and then there's always a dragon you didn't count on. There's always, I didn't watch the green night, I fell asleep, but there was some pretty scary stuff in that. Um, and guess what, number two, the twist and turn is if there isn't something greatly at risk, greatly at risk in this quest, it's not a quest, it's a field trip. Um, I was at the American Academy of Religion one time and a, a professor was talking about taking his students into the wilderness um, on canoe trips and whitewater trips and hiking and how wonderful it was for them to experience the danger of the wilderness. And another professor raised his hand and said, excuse me, was there anything there that could kill them? And the guy said, no, I'd never put them at risk like that. And he said, then it wasn't a wilderness, it was a field trip. And I've never forgotten that. If there's nothing at risk, it's not a quest. And on a quest, there are things that can eat you and things get lost and broken, why? So there's a fallow field. So there's room for transformation, but that's the last thing that was on my list. And it um, was sort of a comeuppance. And then there's the thing that the quest you want isn't the one you get necessarily. Mm -hmm. That's a bummer. You know, you, you, you set out on a quest to write a book called Learning to Walk in the Dark, and you put it out there, and I read it. It's a great book, and then the universe says, let's see how good you are at this. And then you get, you know, two primary family deaths and illnesses at once, and you're the executor of everybody's estate, and the darkness turns out to be, it's not the quest I wanted to do, but it certainly was the quest I was given. Um, made me go back to Dante, in the middle of the journey of our life, listen to this language, I found myself astray in a dark wood. Guess what? The quest begins. Yes. But it's because I found myself there. Yeah. It's not because I went to the dark wood to vanquish it, so. Um, and then even if you commit to a quest, you're bound to accept what comes, and I think that's tricky. I have a friend who went on a vision quest Native American vision quest, and he wanted a, a spirit guide, and he was waiting for a wolf, or an owl, or a, a grand creature of some kind, and all of a sudden a tick started crawling up his arm and said, hello, it's me, your spirit guide, a tick. The story goes on, but it was a great, a great thing, and he said later exactly what he needed. Um, and at the end, and this, this now leads to hope, at the end of the quest, I think, whether it's given, unexpected, you find out it wasn't your quest, it's our, it's our mm -hmm. quest. And, and if you survive it, and not everybody does, you find out, uh, you, you run your marathon and there's somebody at the end who holds out their hand for your baton, dang. 
you know, and you realize you got the baton from somebody else. And your whole quest was about contributing your emotional, physical, spiritual DNA to the gene pool. And that it's not about you. Mm. It's about us. And it always has been. And it's where community becomes my A number one. Hello. My A number one uh, location of hope. And it's not configured like yours might be, you know. I think we have different communities at different times, but, but here's why it's community for me. It's where memory is, is preserved. Memory is a great source of hope, a, a great thing that breathes life into a, a shattered or a weary heart. To remember, if I have not been here before, we have been here before. Human beings have been here before. And, and community is where the memory resides, where there are people older than me and younger than me who, who draw me into that. And it's where the stories, the narratives, I don't know if you ever thought about it, when you look at the stars at night and, and identify the constellations, the constellations are not there. That's just a chaos of stars. But somebody looked up and made a story about a Virgo, about a bear, about a bull. You know, and so the narratives that begin to pull the chaos together and give a beginning and a middle and an end reside in community, in the treasure chests. Um, I've got a lot more on my carefully prepared list. Um, but memory and stories and community, the bucket brigade, you can't put out much of a fire by yourself with one bucket, but hey, if we all had buckets, you know, and we're in a, a relay, um, there's a whole lot we can do, so I can keep going, but those are forms hope takes for me. In the presence of quests that have really not gone according to my plan. Which is our collective story now. Our what? Our collective story. Uh, I mean, who would have known not? when you wrote, you know, Learning to Walk in the Dark that, that the pandemic would be coming? So, it, yeah. so, so how do we hang on to hope now? And when we think about the individual things that we're going through, in many ways you've, you've spoken to us, but you know, how do we find hope t this afternoon or tomorrow or next week? What, what does that journey look like? Of Is it moving toward God? Is it moving toward one another? Um, how do I know um, when that thing that I fear the most uh, that might actually happen one day, the loss of someone that I love, that there'll be enough for me? We don't know that. We don't know that. And um, so for that reason, among many, he's asking me a question, but you know there's not one answer, right? And I also want to tag my age. I hit the big 7-0 this year, so that's a, a sobering age. Um, so in all the other things we've talked about, vocation, meaning, identity, purpose, I am of an age, of a certain age. But, but it, I remember at hospice training that I took early on, they talked about all the hopes that you've pitched way forward, the hopes way out there, and that when the diagnosis comes, whatever it is, we get a lot of different diagnoses. The pandemic was a diagnosis. Um, but, but the hopes come much closer. They become about today. Hmm. I hope I sleep better tonight. Um, you know, I, 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 I hope that rose I planted, you know, pitches out its last fall bloom. I mean, the hopes come much closer. This is the wisdom of the world's great traditions, is when you get anxious about tomorrow, Jesus says, you see that lily? See that bird? You know, draw it in to right now what's in front of you. So for me, um, hope comes much nearer uh, because that's livable. It also invites me to patience. It invites me to surrender my schedule. It reminds me God is not an interventionist as much as God is an intentionalist who will join my intention. So what's my intention? Hope keeps calling me to step up, name, rewrite scripts. But I don't want to leave the conversation without also, for any of you, I want to tag the value of hopelessness at some points. Every one of you has given up on something. Yeah, so let's talk about that because yeah. I think... I want to differentiate between hopes and eternal hope, like we heard with, with John and the I am the Alpha and the Omega. But there is a, very much a part. Part of hope is the hopelessness and the disillusionment that comes with life when we thought something was going to be a particular way and it turns out it's really, really different. So how do we, you know, how do we walk with, with hopelessness um, as a part of hope? How do we walk with 
truth and disillusionment, disillusionment being a part of truth. Mm -hmm. One of your previous guests, Kate Bowler, has become one of my podcast pastors. Mm -hmm. And she, um, you know, week by week by week, if you haven't tuned into Everything Happens, it's a real treat because she's on a quest to defy the perfectibility paradigm that, that juicing celery will solve every problem you've had, past or present, and we're all perfectible. And she says that is not true. She's, she's too kind to say that's a lie, but it's a lie. And, and she makes great room um, to live between everything is possible and nothing is possible, between sort of a denial optimism and a despair, and that we live beautiful, broken lives that don't conform to our expectations. They're full of disillusionment, relationships that end unexpectedly, and then in true Kate Bowler fashion, that today we're still able to live beautiful lives in that. But I don't hear a lot of people telling me that. You know, there's beauty in the brokenness. Or, or when they tell it to me, maybe she tells it in dialogue with a guest on her show as you pull this out in dialogue. But, but so much of hope is about being a better person, being in a different place, getting somewhere I'm not. And, and I think the, the one virtue of hopelessness is you give up on that and you decide here, this body, this life, these contours, and then perhaps you grieve and mourn the life that is not going to be. And thank God God's no stranger to the graveyard where we bury our hopes, our ruined hopes. And there's a gardener there planting new bulbs, you know, and there's a Holy Spirit wind blowing that can be trusted with what happens next. But that's my statement of faith. You just heard my creed mm -hmm. for the day. God's no stranger to the graveyard where we bury our hopes. The gardener's planting new bulbs and the spirit can be trusted with what comes next. So, you know, should you get thin on hope? That's a lot. It's a lot, and it's full of unknowing and uncertainty, so. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm struck that, I think for me, uh, the journey of thinking that if I just said the right kind of prayers, I'd get it, um, that it, that, uh, it was all about recipes and magic potions. Um, and I remember being very angry with God that things did not happen the way that I thought they could happen or things that seemed so r ridiculously unnecessary, you know, like the death of a child. Or, and, and then sort of, as you said, just that, that profound disillusionment um, and that yet still finding God in all of that. And, f and I think for me, um, the fruit of hope, if hope brings any fruit, it's not in the outcomes, though I do pray for the outcomes and I do pray for miracles. It's, it's profoundly that I might find peace. Mm -hmm. and I would wonder if you, you could speak about peace. You know, what, what, <laughs> she what, who has so little. Yeah, so the peace, you know, what, when you've had it, what, can we think of hope and peace and peace being a fruit of hope, uh, the peace of God that passes all understanding in the midst of, my wife says, can I curse? Can I curse? She says, life's a shit show and occasionally you have intermissions. <laughs> uh, and so uh, uh, enjoy, and she said. I love Beverly. I told her last she night. She said, and, and when I get really anxious, she says, Chip, we're having an intermission. Just wait, it'll come. Yeah, yeah. So finding peace, uh -huh. finding peace. What? When you think of the peace that passes all understanding, what do you think? That it happens. That it happens. I have experiences of it happening at the most unlikely times. And what I've got to do is accept the gift of that and not think it's an outcome of my bargaining. See? Mm -hmm. I want to bargain. If mm -hmm. I do this, God, will you do that? Mm -hmm. And then the peace that passes all understanding just passed all bargaining. And it arrived as pure gift. Yeah. And then to resist magical thinking, oh, then maybe if I hold my mouth the same way, it'll happen again. And then I've heard Richard Rohr say that's when, that's when God says, bye-bye, i got to go do, you're getting attached to the gifts, not the giver, so I'm going to go away for a while. I'll be back later. Yes. Isn't it interesting how uh, we don't necessarily, we're not particularly interested in God and God's self, but, but as long as God's a means to an end, that, that seems to work. Then that, that stinks. Yeah. Like who, who loves God unconditionally, right? Yeah. We're Ooh. all about unconditional God, but who loves God unconditionally? Yes. Mm. Mm. Even if I get zip out of it, 
I am yours. Also, I'm substituting trust for hope a lot. And I yeah. think it's just because hope's on too many coffee cups and t-shirts. <laughs> Um, but hope also has a lot of desire in it. I don't know if you've noticed, and it has some demand in it. And, and trust, at least in my language, is a, it, it's more like the peace that passes all understanding. Trust is as vague as, I trust that life is for me in the midst of the shit show. Yeah. I trust this is somehow to awaken me, and I trust that everything that happens is about me waking up. I don't have any evidence of that at all. Really, but, but hope tags my desire too much because I hope for, and then I fill in the blank. Yeah. And I trust, but I don't know where that will take me. Mm -hmm. I, I love, um, is it Leonard Cohen? Probably. In, into your hands we rest. Into your hands we rest. Um, ring the bells that still can ring. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets That's in. That's how the light gets in. What I would love for you to do for us, um, as, w as we're sort of thinking about the quest that we're on, uh, and as we're thinking about where to find hope, uh, we've talked a lot about hope uh, that comes in the community, and, and how can, hope is a deepening, isn't it? It's a, it's a deepening toward the values of trust, um, and, and hopefully the fruit of peace. but. As you are, uh, you've been the hero in your own journey, and you're telling stories and and inviting us to think about where we are um, in our own story. Um, what would you encourage us to think about as we think about our own futures? Um, what What are you thinking about? What do you hope for at seven zero? Um, what do you hope for? Maybe even for the rest of your life. What do you hope for? I wish I knew if the rest of my life was tomorrow or 29 years from now. That would make things a lot easier. Yeah. But I don't know any of that. And I know people who thought they knew that and found out they didn't know that. So again, I, I've just got to come back. I don't do a lot of future pitching right now. But you've caught me at a point in my life. I'm, I'm really pulling in close. I, I think it helps enormously for anyone in this room who uses words like, like faith and hope and trust. Finish the sentence. I trust in what? I trust that what will happen or won't happen. I hope that what? I mean, I think to finish these sentences is hugely important because they, they, they're going to tell you the truth about what you hope for and what you have faith in. And sometimes those need to be revised or rehoped. You know, that's another thing about arriving at hopelessness is with any luck, you, you become a rehoper. Um, who, who knows how to rehope? renew hope, resurge, resurrect, you know, to, to come back. So um, what I hope is at any age, with any circumstance, and that part seems ridiculous, that I could stay present to my life, that I could stay present, that I could resist the urge to go unconscious. I was in a clergy group once, and we all should not have talked about how much we love anesthesia. We were just really love the needle in the vein. <laughs> you know, and we looked around and just laughed at each other. It was so hilarious, all these clergy wanting to go to sleep <laughs> against their will, sort of. But um, I want to resist that. The anesthesia, the addiction, the pacifier, and, it's, and, and I recognize the attraction of all those. I wish to stay present to my life. I wish to stay present to a community of... Um, that doesn't need me to be a hero, doesn't need me to give them advice on the quest all the time, but who will talk to me about it, and who will be people of their own accomplishment or failure who are also human and don't know how to juice celery and whose lives have not gone according to plan, best company I can think of, and who can eat together and drink moderately together <laughs> and laugh at ridiculous things and curse from time to time. Shit show is a wonderful release, just to say it, isn't it, Beverly? Yes. You got other answers, right? The whole reason we're having this conversation is for you to say, I would have said, I would have added, that's what it's for. Mm. Well, would you pray for us that we would have the courage to do just those things, to be present, uh, to allow the questions to guide our quest, um, 
to have compassion for those around us who turns out are as lost as we are, um, um, that we might somehow hold each other, walk with each other, heal, grow, um, die, and be born again. Amen. You just said it. That's my prayer. You want to say it again? Do you remember? What? No, I'm teasing you now. I'm just being mean now. Uh, I, I have become kind of Pentecostal, so if I could say a prayer with my eyes open, it's come, Holy Spirit, our souls inspire, and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you aren't with us, then nothing else matters. So be with us, we pray, in the name of your beloved, all your beloveds. Amen. I have such trust in the Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. This yep. is amazing.